in the series of webinars uh, on uh, the security uh, and uh, international affairs uh, challenges and perspectives in South Caucasus. Uh, uh, just recently, a few, a uh, couple of weeks ago, we had a uh, uh, very good conversation with our Armenian colleagues. We discussed about the, uh, about the war of Russia in Ukraine and uh, discussed the possibilities and the challenges uh, for uh, uh, Armenian-Azerbaijani uh, relationships uh, perspectives. Uh, now, today, I have the honor and the privilege again to have the uh, two privileged uh, friends and guests, uh, our Azeri friends, uh, Ahmad Alili, uh, who is the uh, director of the Caucasus, uh, Caucasus Policy Analysis Center, uh, and uh, Fua Chirago. Both of uh, them are very well known uh, here in Georgia. Of course, you don't need a very big uh, presentation. So it's the head of the department at the Center of Analysis of International Relations. Uh, and um, uh, as I said, uh, uh, you are uh, frequently, uh, before pandemics at least, were visiting and hopefully you will visit soon again uh, Georgia. Uh, but today we are discussing in the format of webinar uh, the issues which I have mentioned before. Of course, if, of course, uh, we were discussing a few minutes ago that before we started the recording that uh, all our minds, hearts, uh, thinking uh, and time is uh, related and dedicated to the, the war of Russia in Ukraine. Now, Russia's aggression in Ukraine and uh, I think uh, it is affecting uh, not only our countries, but uh, it is affecting the whole uh, global uh, international affairs and the security uh, system. Uh, we have seen the weaknesses of the system. We have seen the, the, the failures. We have seen the unities. A lot of things are happening um, while the war is going on. How it is uh, affecting uh, the uh, security and stability of our region, of South Caucasus. How is it seen from, uh, from Baku, from Azeri thinkers um, and policymakers as well? And of course, uh, as the topic, main topic of our uh, today's discussion is uh, the chances, perspectives, and challenges for the normalization of Armenian Azerbaijani uh, uh, relationship. I would like you to uh, share with us your thoughts. Um, uh, you start with the remarks uh, and uh, opening remarks, and I'm sure there will be uh, the questions from uh, the auditorium. Uh, so for the uh, just technical, uh, technical announcement, uh, you can put in the Q&A, uh, here is the icon for Q&A, and you can put it, your question here. I will check it and uh, we'll, uh, we will have the chance to uh, get the answers from both uh, uh, our distinguished guests and friends. Uh, so Ahmad, the floor is yours. You, you are in uh, the, the, the far away from the region. So you start first and then we will move to uh, Fuad. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. First of all, uh, it's a great initiative. Uh, like the, we watched a couple, uh, like last week, our Armenian colleagues uh, speeches on the issue. Today, the Rondella Foundation provided uh, the platform for the uh, Azerbaijan side. So I believe that the uh, Georgian think tank's role, Georgia's role in overall in this issue is very important. And I believe that in this context, well, all this uh, beginnings, uh, they should be welcome. And I believe that we, once in the region, we are going to have uh, more intensive discussions about our problems, the more successful um, results we are going to, uh, you know, uh, we are going to achieve those um, uh, results. So, and um, well, yeah, I am uh, attending, uh, participating in this 
uh, the, the webinar from the other side of the Atlantic, so it's a coincidental. So, but it's a, a pleasure to be here and share my ideas uh, with you. Uh, regarding the question about the Ukrainian, uh, the, the war in Ukraine, Russian uh, Ukrainian war, I would say that uh, for Azerbaijan, the as a as a state, there was a no issue with the, uh, the choice. So basically, Azerbaijan co-pasted Russian role during the Armenian-Azerbaijan war in 2020 war, uh, Karabakh war. Uh, what happened back then, there was a full Russian support to uh, Armenia uh, in terms of the military, finance, economy, etc. But the Russian diplomats, they were quite active in uh, calling parties for, to peace. And as you know, there was a quite active involvement of the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Russian leader Vladimir Putin to this issue. So that's why uh, Azerbaijan basically, and Turkey, I would say also, they copy pasted the very attitude toward uh, the Russian war in Ukraine, which means that uh, with the Ukraine, you provide humanitarian aid, you provide all possible needs. Sokar is doing a lot of uh, energy, um, uh, you know, uh, aid, energy, humanitarian aid, if you may say so, uh, in, in, in Sokar and uh, Azerbaijan is uh, uh, political uh, stand on the issue is clear, but also Azerbaijan calls for peace uh, that copy pastes it and Azerbaijan is um, ready to be platform for this initiative. So that's why when um, a month ago, when the President Zelensky announced that Baku is a one of the possible uh, meeting places for the Russian and Ukrainian leaders that show that, okay, in Baku could uh, uh, be that platform uh, for that. And that was a, a quite important moment for Azerbaijan uh, diplomacy. So that's why I believe that in this regard, there was uh, no choice. Azerbaijan uh, just uh, played it by book. And I believe that um, uh, none of the conflicting parties, they are going to have anything you know, um, they, they show understanding to this issue. But regarding well, how it's going to affect our region, so, you know, uh, if you ask this question to me like a month ago, I would say that, look, uh, will Russia win? So how it will in Ukraine? But now it's clear that there is a no military win in, in, in for Russia in Ukraine. So that's why now we have to analyze the scenarios how uh, uh, Russia is going to stay, um, uh, keep its position, or uh, withdraw from Ukraine and etc. So these scenarios are the important and we have to analyze those scenarios to understand what, how it's going to affect uh, the, the regional affairs in, 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 in South Caucasus. So of course, like if Russia got upper hand in Ukraine, it means that the, the next, as we all suspect that, that um, uh, South Caucasus would be the place where the uh, uh, next uh, attempts, next steps would be uh, taken. But in this context, I believe that once Russia is uh, going to be in, uh, you know, deeply engaged with Ukraine, at least for the next two or three years, uh, or that problem, not Ukraine, but the aftermath of that conflict is going to make Russia busy for the next two or three years. I believe that uh, this uh, Russian-Turkish tandem and the balance, the, the the presence in the South Caucasus, it's going to um, uh, it's going to be affected by this war. So as we can see that, uh, as an indicator, you can take the Russian troops' uh, actions in in Karabakh, when in December they would let in um, French and uh, presidential candidate to Karabakh and they create a lot of tension between Baku and Moscow. But uh, last month, they did not even let in Armenian uh, MPs to Karabakh, right? So that shows that how the balance changed in the region in, uh, and it's not in the uh, favor of uh, Russia. But also we have to take into account that in, in how the social, political and economic processes might develop in the North Caucasus, how the changing balance of the power in the South Caucasus uh, is going to attract other powers who else will be willing to increase its presence in the South Caucasus. So this creates a lot of uh, challenging uh, uh, moments for uh, all of uh, South Caucasus countries. So that's why in this context, I believe that uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia, they are rushing against the time. Uh, it basically like the we 
see that a, like something massive is coming from outside of the region and the South Caucasus is not ready for that, frankly speaking. There is no enough regional integration. There is no enough, uh, like, you know, the regional um, political military security set up to, um, you know, to stand against all that, that something big possibly come. It doesn't matter like the destructive, constructive, but it's something really a big change, big geopolitical change are coming. And so that's why uh, we are facing a quite a big moment now. We have to move fast. We have to move, we have to secure regional integration, at least start that regional integration as fast as possible. And so that we should be ready for the uh, next waves of the geopolitical change around the region. Uh, in that context, Armenian Azerbaijan issue is uh, completely, uh, you know, it, it gets a completely new, uh, let's say, colors. So if Armenian Azerbaijan issue is, is still, uh, let's say, in the phase of the the, the, you know, if there is a, some issues left for discussions and there is a not mutual understanding between Baku and Yerevan, so it means that regional unity is not possible. So if regional unity is not possible, it means that um, uh, we as a region, South Caucasus as a region, is not ready for the coming change, for the coming geopolitical changes. We know what happened in 1920s. We know what happened later. So that's why it is the moment when we move fast, we secure some um, uh, platform between Armenia and Azerbaijan, secure some agreement between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and make sure that there is uh, enough uh, regional uh, efforts uh, to bring all these South Caucasus countries together. And uh, again, as you mentioned that before pandemics and even after the pandemics, I had a chance to visit Tbilisi. I had a chance to meet uh, some members of the Georgian government. And like, I, I'm, I'm sure that Georgia is very much interested in this kind of, because there is a clear understanding of those threats that uh, we might face in the upcoming um, um, the months, years, and decades. So that's why I believe that Georgia and Azerbaijan in this sense, they have to get united. And uh, frankly speaking, I, uh, the Georgian diplomat, the Georgian government members visits to Armenia and Azerbaijan recently, that gives a uh, great hope to us. So I will, I will stop here. Like if there is something else, I will um, uh, continue my uh, speech. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ahmad. A lot of lot of issues which I would like to um, uh, follow up on, and uh, I will certainly do. But first, I will give the floor to uh, to Fuad, and uh, let us let us hear his views, uh, mm -hmm. and then then go to the Q, Q and A. Uh, and thank you, Ahmad, once again. And uh, Fuad, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for the invitation for this opportunity. And greetings to all my friends in Georgia at your center. Uh, I will start from your question about the, the, the effect of the Ukraine, uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, I would say that it has, uh, uh, war has now uh, two short term uh, or mid term effects now what we can calculate of course we don't know what will happen in the uh, in the long term and how we'll have uh, all these developments will have a spillover effect on our region uh, the first effect is that um, our president uh, in his uh, previous remarks uh, several times indicated that uh, uh, our conflict was uh, unique uh, in the sense that, for example, um, the, in all conflicts in the post-Soviet Union, in Ukraine, in Georgia, in Moldova, uh, West was supporting unanimously and without any uh, second meaning or unequivocally uh, territorial integrity issue. and was putting this uh, Abkhazia, Ossetia, uh, Prednistrovia, Crimea, uh, and was always saying that this conflict is uh, different. And in these terms, uh, somehow the position of the West and Russia was overlapping. 
in our conflict. Uh, and it was unfortunate for us, we were uh, calling it double standards, we were fighting against it, we were arguing about, against it. Uh, but what, uh, and uh, it's interestingly that after the war, in two, uh, during and after the war, uh, in a 44 day war, West was not actually uh, was uh, resisting the Russian initiatives in the region. So uh, willing uh, to give uh, Russia initiative to separate parties, actually uh, during the active military phase, for example, the president of France uh, called the uh, Russian president to interfere and to stop uh, uh, the, the war. And the Western experts, for example, like uh, the Thomas de Waal in, uh, in his uh, tweets, were actively calling Russia to immediate, immediately stop the war. So after the, when, after the three parties uh, agreement declaration uh, on, uh, on November 10th, um, Russia was taking all initiative uh, about post-war uh, conflict resolution and resettlement and etc. Russian peacekeepers were in the region and was ousting the West. And West also was uh, not uh, eager to interfere in the region. I always say that the West was willing to give uh, Russia to, um, uh, to do the, the dirty job in the, in the region. But uh, after the war in Ukraine, uh, uh, a lot of things has changed. West has become more active in the region because of the geopolitical uh, importance of the region, because of the one of the few uh, alternative energy res uh, resource and because of that it's reached to the Southern part of Russia and there's many issues. Uh, but at the same time, Russia, I, or I say that uh, lost, for us now it became another problem for Azerbaijan, and for Armenia. Uh, Russia lost its um, right of, uh, the, you know, the, the great powers, members of the UN Security uh, Council, uh, had a uh, right, uh, uh, self-attained right, uh, to make a peacemaker. Uh, the, so Russia's role in the international level, uh, Russia started to delegitimize itself. So any agreement, any uh, deal, any anything uh, signed with Russia will be put uh, under suspicion, so you will no, not be legitimate. So that's why uh, what, what we see that the, the, the uh, United States and France renamed the, 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 the persons that were assigned to this the conflict uh, co-chairs. So they've become uh, the negotiator for the region. So Russia, uh, the, the, the West, uh, the United States and France will not sit on the, around one table with Russia and uh, negotiate any issue, any conflict and the problem in the world. So what we see right now is that uh, it's a competition over who will manage the conflict resolution or the, the post-conflict realities uh, in the region. West became more active, uh, initiated two uh, meetings in uh, Brussels, which yielded, I think, I believe, results, real results. Uh, and Moscow, became a chillies about it. And during the uh, Armenian foreign minister's last visit to Moscow, the Lavrov openly said that West is betraying the interest of uh, Armenia. 
So what we see, if we come to right now to the Armenia, to our main topic of our uh, uh, discussion, what we see is that Russia is not interested uh, with the mediation uh, of the West and the uh, opposition uh, in Armenia and, uh, is not interested in the Western mediation. And I should make one uh, very important remark here. The Brussels uh, mediation, uh, I wouldn't say it's actually the mediation, the facilitation. West, the West is trying to be facilitator, not a mediator, not, a, uh, not trying to impose the terms to the both sides, just providing a room and calling the, that the, the you should take to, you should agree uh, and to resolve and they will, in the end, we will get a benefit, re rewards for, uh, from the probably West for the uh, for the, for the resolution of this conflict, uh, <clears throat> and that's why I think that the, the title of today's event that you put it uh, is uh, chosen very correctly, and it's uh, historic. Um, whatever will happen from now on, whether both Armenia and Azerbaijan continue to fight or finally to come to on common denominator and to normalize, this time period we live in uh, will be the closest ever period to the normalization and peace. It's my personal uh, opinion. Are we heading to the normalization? Actually, I've been uh, even uh, asking this uh, question as a great achievement. Uh, we could not even ask this question till the Second Karabakh War. Uh, now we ask this question. Now it depends on the on Armenia. Uh, I specifically say that not on both sides, but uh, specifically on Armenia, whether we will heading to normalization affirmatively or again we will continue put this, this under the question. And the, we might say in or uh, about it affirmatively or uh, the, uh, the, normal, uh, the process will be, our uh, relations will be normalized in one or two months, uh, I think everything will be uh, clear. Uh, as I said, um, uh, the, the, the Russia and the position now uh, uh, are not interested uh, the, and we, if we look at the statements of the Armenian officials, it has some, uh, somehow a little bit changed after the Pashinyan's visit to Moscow. Pashinyan uh, is, is trying, uh, still trying to continue its rhetoric that he had to uh, before the uh, Moscow visit. Uh, but at the same time, he is waiting for the, the results of the, the, the internal turmoil. Uh, pe people, uh, uh, people who protest uh, in, uh, in Armenia right now, uh, I say these people are afraid of peace more than war. And, and all the propaganda is aimed uh, to scare to threaten the Armenians, Pugait Prosta, uh, about the outcomes of the peace uh, and normalization. For example, former President Kocharyan last year during the parliamentary election campaign gave the interview to the famous Russian journalist Pozner. He openly and very clearly said that he is against opening the borders with Turkey and normalization. Because according to him, this will transform Armenia and other Ajaria. So the Turkish capital and Azerbaijan capital will come and will buy everything. So this is for them is uh, end of day and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, tragedy. So as a Georgian, you, uh, you, Alex, you would say that was a, it's a threat to the Georgian security having a, 
and uh, Azerbaijani or Turkish capital in your capital uh, in your country or not. So uh, the the following the defeat, uh, the Armenian society is on the dilemma. There are those such as just I mentioned it, Kacharyan, Sarkisyan. Uh, like the former prime minister Vazgim Manukyan, who also openly said that he is against the opening the borders and the normalization, and who are calling for revenge and a new war. They don't want to accept a new reality. Their positions are understandable. They all invested their lives, energy, more of a time and energy of the Armenian people on this, uh, on their cause. They drew their legitimization from the successful war against Azerbaijan and, Azerb uh, and, and Karabakh coast. They ruled Armenia on the basis of this legitimization. Uh, so they do understand that where the alternative track might head to. Uh, so the, today, Pashinyan is still uh, on the dilemma. He actually was in the, he found himself in the middle of the uh, his dilemma on the first day. Uh, when he came to power, there was a hope that the, uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia finally uh, will reach agreement. Uh, the back channel between uh, leaders were established without any mediation. It's a recently revealed uh, uh, information. You can find it on the media. Uh, and Pashinyan then asked it from the president, uh, Aliyev, uh, time for study the conflict and to consolidate the power. The, uh, Aliyev gave him the, uh, this time, this opportunity. But somehow uh, this... Uh, the normalization was torpedoed, uh, sabotaged by uh, outside in a position and the people inside the government uh, of Pashinya, like people, uh, defense minister Tonoyan, he, you know, the, uh, the very, it's very important that exactly on what day he declared the new, uh, new territories for the new world. Uh, on the first official, on the day of the first official meeting of the President Aliyev and Pashinyan in Vienna in uh, 2019, uh, March 29, Cup, after a couple of hours. So the Pashinyan was pushed to take more harder line and eventually, he said that the Karabakh is Armenia period. And I'm not going to in the details, we had a war. So the, another chance was uh, probably uh, for the normalization in the 19th, so when the Terpetresian was in the power, when he was also forced to leave the uh, the, 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 the government, when he uh, addressed the Armenian uh, people with open letter and calling that if they do not come to agreement today, uh, the terms that Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan is agreed today, tomorrow we will, Azerbaijan will not even give it a part, part of uh, that we they are ready to, uh, to give it now. So, uh, very important period, very uh, crucial period for the both uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, I believe the rational uh, thinking will prevail in Armenia. Uh, I hope that the, uh, the people finally will understand that they will no, uh, we will not be able to live with the closed borders. 83% of the, uh, the borders are closed for the 30 years. 
and there is no dangerous threat to, to trade to come to visit each other normalize uh, uh, the relations so uh, probably i will stop here uh, if you have a questions i will be happy to answer thank you thank you uh, Fuad, uh, for your very very interesting uh, remarks and uh, uh, it's a great uh, food for thought uh, for both uh, uh, your presentations. And of course, let me start with the question of how do you see uh, where could be the solution of the uh, Armenian Azerbaijani uh, relations? You mentioned what uh, about the internal turmoil uh, in uh, Armenia uh, and led by the opposition. Uh, the, talking to our uh, Armenian colleagues and friends uh, uh, a week ago, they uh, or ten days ago, they they mentioned that the uh, uh, it was a kind of a message for you know, for you for Azeris that uh, maximalist approach would be a mistake uh, 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 by pushing uh, pushing Pashinyan. Uh, uh, into a bigger uh, challenge and into a bigger difficulties. And even, uh, and they mentioned very concretely and clearly and openly about the status of nagorno karabakh Is this an issue where you uh, believe that you have to start with to agree uh, and then to get to the um, overall overwhelming uh, the normalization of the bilateral relations between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Because as you very rightly mentioned, uh, uh, the opposition is pressuring and the Pashinyan is waiting for the, the developments in the streets. Right now there are the rallies in the streets and uh, um, uh, you are uh, you're also right that uh, they, they maybe they could be more uh, afraid of, uh, because of propaganda, maybe more afraid of peace than of the war. But, uh, but the, the Armenian colleagues were also saying that uh, if to push too hard towards the agreement on uh, the status of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, then uh, you could get uh, the gentleman uh, you have mentioned, uh, Zarkisyan, Kocharyan, uh, Manukyan in the next government very soon. So uh, it will be a dead end for the Azerbaijani Armenian relationship. Do you think so? Uh, start? Yes, I can. I can start. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, Azerbaijan really uh, wants to have some results with Armenia. As I said earlier, there is a big change coming in our regions. So we have to have some results so we can move to the regional integration as much as fast. Again, uh, we know what happened in 1980, 1920, when we, you are separately, when you're in problems, you are quite easily can get under control. So this is the issue, like that we have to move fast, very fast. And as Azerbaijan understands that, and frankly speaking, uh, uh, I've been uh, like the, one of the biggest questions in, in Baku, uh, that uh, there were several questions, but if you sum up those questions, they might sound like this. Uh, and that, that, that questions were addressed to me that, what is in President Aliyev's mind, Karabakh or something bigger? I said Karabakh, but without having something bigger in mind, you cannot do anything in Karabakh. So it's focusing Karabakh, everything, but we also have in the mind that something big is coming. We have to keep eye on that issue. So is Azerbaijan pushing? Uh, yes, let, uh, but- Let me jump in here. Uh, yes. What do you mean in the, uh, something bigger is coming? Like, uh, let's say that uh, post-Soviet military confrontation. I would say that okay, it's it's not like post-Soviet time period ended in South Caucasus in, with the 2020 Karabakh War. There is no post-Soviet period anymore. The Karabakh 20 and, and if anyone had any 
uh, problem with accepting that the post-Soviet ended so they can look at the Ukrainian war right now there. So it's definitely for those who were having doubt that Karabakh ended, Karabakh war in 2020 ended post-Soviet reality. I believe that what's happening in Ukraine there, it's a quite strong linked issue with the Karabakh. Uh, it is, it's ended. So the old, old reality, geopolitical reality is no more. So what is new? Uh, so it can be anything. It can be big military clash. It can be complete uh, reconfiguration of the uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic um, landscape in the South Caucasus. How would take place? Uh, it can the be restoration of Soviet Union. Exactly. So, but, but this is the this is the issue. Like you know, like uh, like we know, we are sure that something ended. But what is coming to replace it? We are probably in that time period. So Azerbaijan, there is a clear understanding that South Caucasus should get united. Whatever is coming from out there, South Caucasus should have more regional integration platform. And the biggest problem for that is Armenian, uh, Armenian Azerbaijan relations um, uh, night now. So that's why this is uh, this is a big issue. So, but my colleagues issue that uh, Azerbaijan pushing uh, Pashinyan out. Uh, frankly speaking, like a if any new government comes in Armenia, what kind of foreign policy options they have? Uh, that's another question. Like the what policy options Pashinyan uh, is not using that the others is going to come, the others are going to come and they're going to use. That's a, one of the, let's answer that question. Like the, this is a quite a big uh, interest, uh, interesting topic for me that why, what they expect that Pashinyan is not doing, but the newcomer is going to do. But it all, it's also a wrong perception that Azerbaijan is looking for instability in Armenia. In contrary, Azerbaijan looking for a stable government in Armenia who can have a deal with Azerbaijan and who can implement those issues. And imagine like a, if a Armenian uh, army after the 2020 Karabakh war, it got uh, quite a, let's say, uh, dysfunctional management, let's say, and if that process continued, and we saw what happened with the generals in the Armenian army, et cetera, if that process continued and we had a decentralized Armenian army, we would have a bunch of the loon wolf attacks. So do we need that? Alex. No, uh, no way. So, so, so that's, I'll, let, me, let me finalize this issue. Like the, yeah, sorry. Um, so that's why uh, this loon wolf attacks uh, Azerbaijan, that, that idea that Azerbaijan is looking for destabilization in Armenia is uh, uh, completely uh, uh, wrong. But the, uh, the one very big question like that is uh, Azerbaijan, that the name, the title of this webinar is Azerbaijan and Armenia uh, moving toward normalization. I believe that the question should be paraphrased that will Azerbaijan and Armenia succeed with the normalization this time? Because Armenia and Azerbaijan had normalization process in 1998, when Terpetrosian was ready to sign a certain document. In 1999, when quite influential figures in Armenian parliament were ready to have a deal with Azerbaijan, they were gunned down. 2001 QS process, that stopped. Rambolia process stopped. Like we know what happened in Kazan in 2011 stopped. So why there was a no successful diplomatic effort in aftermath of the April 2016? That also the problem. So the question is that Armenia and Azerbaijan, they were ready to sign something. They were ready to normalize their relations in the last 30 years so many times, but they failed. So the history of the Armenian Azerbaijan normalization process is full of unsuccessful attempts more than successful attempts. And so then uh, again, those ideas that Armenians and Azerbaijanis cannot negotiate with us is completely wrong. We can negotiate with each other, but, and it's going to be a test this time. Armenian Azerbaijan normalization process is going to be a test to see that what has changed in the South Caucasus, the security uh, uh, you know, environment, the international environment, uh, to what extent Armenia has changed, to what extent Azerbaijan has changed. In the previous years, there was a, several um, uh, attempts and all of them because of the various reasons were not that successful. Uh, and that, frankly speaking, I blame uh, external powers. I, I know that it's a tendency to blame external powers, but Azerbaijan and Armenia, it's, they got quite a, a 
many times when they were so close in resolution of this conflict, but uh, there was a they could not make the last step attempt. So will they be able to do that now? And that's going to be indication and test for the uh, what has changed in the South Caucasus in the last 30 years. It, what that process Would that's happening. you happened, make a significant steps without agreeing first on the status? Alex, Alex. Okay, let, let, let Ford wants to jump in, so let's him jump in. Alex, so I will go in. Alex, okay. Alex, let me answer the, to, to your question. So our Armenians, you say that our, our Armenian colleagues say that Azerbaijan is pushing too much. Azerbaijan position is too maximalist. So probably Azerbaijan should suggest uh, propose something status. Yeah. So did did I understood? Did I understand right? Uh, yeah. The, their, their position was the, the the message was the too maximalistic approach. I see. Okay. Let, could let me lead to so, bigger first, regional turmoils in uh, okay. Armenia. Okay. You could get another counterpart okay. in first. Uh, and Alex, the, first, the, the reality that was existed before 2020 was uh, created by illegal use of force. And Azerbaijan restored by using legal, legally using of force. So the problem with our Armenian colleague is that they, it's, it's, it's the approach. Why do they think that they have a right to say something about the right and uh, status or territorial arrangements about Azerbaijan? The same might apply to the, the tomorrow. The, uh, the uh, can say that Armenians also live in uh, Chavakhetia. Do they have a Yerevan have a, any right to suggest or put forward say anything that you should? Uh, change the status of Chavakhetia or you they have maybe, a what maybe I was misunderstood but they were, their approach was quite uh, constructive their message was quite constructive they I see. realized they so realized the, the, that they lost the war they are also I see uh, they are also see. Uh, very much for the normalization okay, okay. the war. first the, for this you, you know that during the war yeah because of, despite all military advantages, Azerbaijan intentionally did not enter to the, except the, in one case, uh, to the densely Armenian populated areas. In order not to inflict uh, civilian casualties. You can, there are studies uh, that, that, that actually the Karabakh war was one of the, uh, the uh, the war uh, in recent years the, the where civil casualty rates is the one of the lowest level in decades. So Azerbaijan intentionally did not. Uh, so you they t uh, speak about a goodwill. Azerbaijan waited for more ten days in order Armenians leave Kalbajar. Gave the ten days. What they did, they planted more mines, cut mm -hmm. all trees and destroyed everything. So the, one of the goodwill was the, the road that were passing through the, in Zengilan, the Iran, uh, Iran Armenia. So for, uh, for a couple of months, Azerbaijan did not touch it and uh, make, did not any interfere. Uh, to the so the, when Azerbaijan makes uh, gestures of the goodwill, it's not met adequately. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the first, in order to uh, start about or, or to talk about the rights of the Armenians in Karabakh, first. The principal condition is the Armenia must recognize territorial integrity of Azerbaijan without any precondition unequivocally. You know. So after that, after that, because the Armenians say that uh, about self uh, self determination, but they do not understand that they, uh, there are two different way of the self determination: internal 
self-determination and external self-determination. But they mean when they speak about uh, self-determination, they only mean external self-determination. So they must be very clear. So look at the, all statements of the Armenians. In, Karab uh, the, in separatist Kar uh, Karabakh in, in, uh, in Armenia. So our Karabakh will never be part of Azerbaijan. And so what do you expect after that from Azerbaijan? The second uh, issue is that Azerbaijan is confident in its power. Azerbaijan understand that uh, it will get whatever uh what's plans do it's uh, so so the whatever government now uh, to, today uh comes in power in in armenia kocharyan or etc it will not change this the status quo already changed it azerbaijan took the control of the, 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 all the uh, necessary territory so um it's for Armenians to speak about uh, about uh, if they they should understand this. They should not use the word status. You, they can use the, the rights of the Armenians, but also they uh, do uh, have to understand that uh, they have to a little bit abstain to speak a lot about the rights of the uh, Armenians in Karabakh. It's uh, inter it's considered interference of the domestic uh, affairs of the another country. Okay, then uh, we will uh, have the chance, I'm sure, to get together, all together, Georgian, uh, Azeri, and Armenian uh, experts and colleagues to discuss the into more details. Uh, we have touched upon the issue of uh, uh, Russia's uh, war in Ukraine and uh, Russia's aggression, and uh, uh, I have uh, the question to Ahmed uh, about the, you said that there couldn't be the win-win uh, situation uh, uh, in the war of uh, Russia and Ukraine, if I understood correctly. Uh, and uh, I'm sure, uh, I misunderstood maybe, and uh, if uh, you clarify on that. I just wanted to learn uh, your views. Is there a chance that if uh, the war uh, um, between Russia and Ukraine is uh, uh, tracked and uh, uh, for months or maybe years, uh, will it cause the uh, uh, weakening of the positions of uh, Russia in the South Caucasus? And could it end up in the withdrawal of the so-called, it's my uh, terminology, of the so-called peacekeepers, uh, just newly established peacekeepers base uh, from your country, of Russia? Okay. So uh, pro probable few words, because uh, we give the floor to Fuad, like the, uh, I want to finalize the speech, like the, the from the previous question, like that, and I will move to that. <laughs> Regarding the, the, the maximalist approach, uh, we forget that the maximalist approach for Armenia is uh, Karabakh without Azerbaijanis. The maximalist approach for Azerbaijan, Karabakh without Armenians. That are the maximalist position and Azerbaijan moved away from that position since 1998. So there is a, like the Azerbaijan is for Karabakh Armenians in Karabakh. And it wants like that, the basically uh, that was on the agenda for the last 30 years that getting the highest degree of the autonomy, right? So in the last 30 years, why there was no success in that? That's a completely other topic for discussions. I don't want to stay on that issue, but the, the maximalist approach for parties is having Karabakh without the population of other. And for the last 30 years, Armenia achieved that. Like they were they're holding the territory without any Azerbaijani presence in Karabakh and in wider Karabakh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh in the wider uh, Karabakh region. So that's the one issue. So that's why even now, when Azerbaijan says that we are ready to provide for Karabakh Armenians, uh, like the, the certain like the uh, 
uh, for them to exercise their cultural rights without any attachment to the territory. So I believe that it means that, uh, you know, without, uh, this is also like the moving away from the uh, maximalist rights. So that's why like, a, let's make clear that what are the maximalist uh, issues in this regard. And uh, as they well, they say that, well, with the Pashinyan and the others, like uh, as mentioned that Azerbaijan is not interested, it's not in Azerbaijan's best interest to have any destabilization in uh, in the South Caucasus. Regarding the change of the, look, I did not say that anything about the win-win situation. I basically say that uh, we it's so many unclear situation. And frankly speaking, uh, when the war in Ukraine started, I stopped any rational analysis of the situation because that starting that war is like the, there, there is no rational calculation or at least from the, uh, from my perspective as a researcher of the, like the, 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 the South Caucasus and the wide region, uh, there is no rational explanation to this issue. So that's why uh, any rational analysis uh, is not possible, frankly speaking, I believe. Uh, so that's why we have to, um, and, and the war is the least prognosable issue and the war is going on. So that's why we have to wait for its results. But I don't think that mm -hmm. Russia is going to come out uh, as, the, you know, in, as uh, Russia is not going to achieve its initial goals. That's for sure. Will Russia be able to transform that achievement to the uh, public narrative of uh, the, the party that won the war, war, you know, if you can convince your population that you won the war, uh, the results are going to be less extreme. But if you cannot convince your population that the, the war is won by you, so then there will be some results, some, uh, you know, some uh, problems for sure. How it's going to affect in the region? Uh, again, as I mentioned, like the the 2020 Karabakh war create the new reality and the reality from the, the main external actors in this context are Russia and Turkey. And that's going to change the balance of power in South Caucasus. Turkey is stronger in the South Caucasus because there is a, you know, have Azerbaijan. Um, Azerbaijan um, was, you know, basically all Azerbaijan resources in the last 30 years, diplomatic, economic, political resources, they were spent, on, there was only one goal, and that was Karabakh. And so that's why Turkey is, uh, because its its partner in the South Caucasus, Azerbaijan, is quite strong. And that means that there's more chances for Turkey to gain more ground. But then once you have that balance changed, what about the other powers? Will they want to, what kind of role they would want to have in the region? European Union, United States, Iran, uh, China. So uh, the, now you have, or before 24th of February, you had some uh, new balance that was accepted by everyone, but now you have a, again, a new uh, balance, you know, like the, 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 the balance that was created after the, 2020 Karabakh war that changed once more. So when we, it's not still clear on what changed, what not, but it's 100% sure that Turkey is going to gain more ground. And that means that Azerbaijan is going to gain more ground. And that's going to transform into the issues in Karabakh. That's going to transform into the Azerbaijan European Union relations, Azerbaijan United States relations. And it is, in fact, uh, you know, it's the process going on, as you can see. That if, they, like, and, and of course. Azerbaijan or Iranian relationship? Sorry? Could it affect the Azerbaijan Iranian relationship? Uh, well, uh, if Turkey gains more ground, uh, I believe that uh, Iran would be more. Iran would have more incentive to say that I want to have a bit more uh, uh, like leverage in South Caucasus also. So that's I believe that the only reason why Iran did not use the armed forces that it accumulated in the border region with Azerbaijan was uh, Iranian MFA's visit to Russia. So Russia was the main power, and we all it's all clear that for the last 30 years, the regional security architecture of the South Caucasus in this part of the world, it was there was a Russian-Azerbaijan relations cooperations in, 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 that, in, in that sense. So how it will change? So it's another question. So, they, so, so again, so many uncertainties. Um, and like, I, I, we can manipulate, but 
as a researcher and that, that knows that how it's hard to say. So that's why I would prefer saying that I am not qualified even to prognose that. So that would be, so, you know, that would be honest answer. I, I can say, of course, few issues, but I, I believe that like saying that like, well, uh, the war is less prognosable issue and we have to wait for certain yes, results. Fuad, what do you think? As I, as I said, uh, it's very hard to make any long-term prognosis. Uh, so we can speculate about the short term, that's, which I already mentioned in my speech, uh, the competition over the region is increasing. The West uh, be, uh, became a more active uh, in the region. Uh, not only the uh, European Union, but I see that the United States has become a more engaged in the region. So uh, I think that the that, that, that strategy that was launched by the Obama reset uh, with Russia, but pulling back from the region is, 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 is changing. Just look at the recent visits of the state, the high level of the State Department, U.S. State Department officials to the, uh, uh, to the region. Um, and to be the, the ambassadors in the region have become a more active recently. Three U.S. ambassadors in the region met in Baku. Uh, uh, the Armenian foreign ministers on these days were in Washington, United States has started with Armenia strategic dialogue. So uh, what we see is that the, the, the West is becoming more active in the region. Uh, uh, now it's, it's, it's a, lit, a, lot, a lot of things will depend uh, on the uh, Russian uh, reaction to the Western engagement in the, in the region, you know. Uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia together uh, long, uh, together launch it and you know the uh, different regional projects with the enormous help of the West Pakitabilisi cars the Pakitabilisi Jehan and etc and etc so in fact these projects were bypassing uh, Russia was against the Russian interest so Russia until now uh, were tolerating uh, partly because the not uh, par partly because of the Western action, partly because of the policies of Azerbaijan or regional powers and etc. But recently, the member of the Russian Duma Delyagin suggested to strike a nuclear uh, tactical nuclear. Uh, missiles on the uh, oil infrastructure of Azerbaijan. So the, if everything gets worse and worse for the uh, for the yeah. Russians, Russians and they yeah. will be, uh, they become uh, more radicalized. Uh, we don't know what will uh, happen. So uh, you just imagine they put put yourself into the feet of the Russians. So the West is cutting the Russian oil and gas uh, from, the, uh, from the market. Uh, and, and just right to, uh, behind in the, in the South, another country was uh, benefiting uh, from it. Just a few kilometers. So uh, if, 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 if um, they became more desperate, uh, more, more, more radicalized, I don't know, I, can, I don't want even to uh, think about this worst case scenarios. So the, uh, in, in most cases when the, in the past when we say, we said that the worst case scenarios, the people assume that it's less probable, it's less possible. But now uh, recent development shows that the worst case scenarios are more probable, <laughs> probable <laughs> became a probable one. 
Um, yeah, before 21st of February, you know, a lot, very few have thought uh, that it was, it could be such a large scale invasion uh, of uh, Russian Federation. Right? So uh, for, for, for Azerbaijan, in addition, uh, for, for, for uh, about Russia, another uncertainty is Iran. So probably Georgia is a little bit away from uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, from Iran, and uh, Iran has a less leverages to influence uh, Iran because of the religion and, and etc. Cultural and ethnic. Uh, Georgia. Uh, yes, it, it's the Georgia is away from. Uh, yeah. yeah. You have Azerbaijani community, but it's still, uh, still. Still is a wave. Uh, so, uh, so we 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 are only we are only country in the world which is bordered by Russia and Iran at the same time. So uh, they both have a some kind of imperial memory and imperial trauma. Both of them. The the Iran uh, until recently were to, uh, were a little bit mm, not active, but it was working. It was planting its agents and influence, soft power tools, and then et cetera, et cetera, but was not uh, active and uh, voiceful because it was, uh, Iran was uh, confident that West, the Russia will not allow the West come to its Northern border. But when the, the uh, influence of the Russia inevitably after the war in Ukraine will decrease, for them it will create some kind of vacuum which Turkey or the West might fulfill, which is for them is not acceptable. So uh, a lot of things is uh, also is the, uh, it de depends on the internal dynamics of the Iranian political system, IRGC or Mullahs or liberals and etc. cetera, mm -hmm. how all these power, power games will end in the end uh, and how it will have a spillover effect on our uh, region. A lot of uh, uncertainties. So no one, I can say that, uh, making uh, pre uh, predictions. Mm -hmm. One thing is clear: we should be very, uh, we should be prepared for uh, worst scenarios. I see, I see. Uh, thank you, thank you both. And very last question: you touched upon the very important issue of the uh, oil and gas supplies. Um, and uh, to in these days, from the very beginning of the war, uh, large scale invasion of, of uh, Russian Federation in uh, uh, Ukraine, um, the Ukrainian um, President Zelensky and his team are demanding and asking for full embargo on uh, the uh, oil and gas uh, purchases from the Russian Federation. It seems like uh, there is, uh, uh, they are quite close uh, to the uh, agreement within the European Union on the oil uh, uh, embargo. Yes. Uh, it more looks like that, uh, much less about the natural gas. Yes. But is, uh, despite these all uh, threatening statements uh, of some uh, Russian uh, uh, politicians. And by the way, the last thing you, you mentioned to put myself in the uh, Russian shoes, the last thing I would want is the putting myself in the Russian shoes right now <laughs> and never in my life. But, uh, uh, but um, uh, back to the issue of the uh, uh, um, energy supplies. Is Azerbaijan uh, ready uh, to not fully maybe, but to replace Russian Federation and provide European Union uh, with the more uh, natural gas and more uh, uh, oil. The, 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 I'm not an energy expert, but I will try to answer uh, because uh, I have a friends 
colleagues who work on uh, so Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan does not have a such scale of energy resources or uh, that uh, yeah. full, fully substitute the Russian. Uh, so uh, it can increase at a certain uh, certain level uh, with the uh, with the support of the of the West. Uh, it can. Uh, so now uh, it can increase its uh, thousand gas corridor will might increase its um, pumping capacity at 20 30 percent more or i don't know but it, it will not help uh, significantly uh, european uh, gas demand uh, natural gas demand but Again, uh, Will it it's... irritate Russian Federation? I'm sorry? Will it irritate the Russian Federation? Of course. So, so do you think that they will not? Of course. But they will under, they do understand that Azerbaijan does not possess the such scale, such a level of the uh, gas reserves that to uh, substitute even even if okay, uh, even if Azerbaijan had a such level of the gas reserves, the infrastructure that to uh, to export to deliver to the European uh, market uh, is not enough. It's still what we have is uh, gained a significant strategic. Um, it, our uh, infrastructure gained a strategic significance. The southern gas pipeline. You know, it's it's again. I want to. I <coughs> I would like to here to blame the uh, the West and collective Europe again. If they had, for example, uh, six years or ten years ago, uh, supported. Uh, our gas, uh, the, this infrastructure, and make it, for example, to uh, for larger uh, for the larger capacity, or if they would uh, be more uh, active uh, with Turkmenistan to bring to Turkmenistan uh, uh, gas reserves to the market, we would probably. Now we would uh, we will uh, we would have a, a different uh, pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing is one thing is must be very clear. Baku Tbilisi Jehan was built with the strong support of the United States when the United States was in the region, when the United States has a clear vision in the region, uh, when they working pushing. You know, uh, but when they left the region and started to, uh, to bring all the issues on the agenda with these uh, countries, uh, you, we did not have a, uh, uh, such a strategic uh, pr projects. When Azerbaijan built the Southern Gas Pipeline, there was a lot of experts in the West. Uh, Azerbaijan will not be able to fulfill this, uh, it's a political project, it's not economic uh, project, and then et cetera, et cetera. There was a lot of critics. I see. They, they failed at the Nabucco, you know, they, um, so now they uh, get what they planted. <laughs> okay, my very last question would be to Ahmed. Ahmed and of course, you can comment on the energy issues, but uh, both of you, uh, I would like you to, to hear from you. Where do you see the immediate uh, areas of uh, normalization, spheres where you could agree and start cooperation with Armenian uh, counterparts? And this would be my last question, but Ahmed, please answer the first question on the energy supplies and then and continue with the, the areas of the possible cooperation. Yeah, well, um, um, I would say that that's not a question to Azerbaijan, frankly speaking. Uh, that's a question to the European Union and the United States. 
uh, this what's the coin right now with this? Uh, uh, you know, it, it's by now it's clear that the only route passing from the Europe to Asia, I mean the China and so forth, and without the Russian and Iranian presence is Azerbaijan, right? So Azerbaijan and Georgia together they are in this route, um, and this opens a lot of new opportunities. Now China wants more cargo to pass to Kazakhstan, Caspian Sea, Azerbaijan, Georgia. And uh, Kazakhstan wants its oil to be transferred uh, uh, through this route also. Turkmenistan is quite interested. But if you say that Azerbaijan will take a political, military, economic, uh, political, military cost, and will gain some economic benefit from that also, uh, I would say that, uh, no, that's, this is beyond uh, Azerbaijan's capacity. That's beyond any country. Uh, capacity of any country in the region. So that's why it's the question to the European Union and the United States that to what extent they are interested in this route, to what extent they are interested in Azerbaijan working on it in this field. And frankly speaking, this means that they have to be provide Azerbaijan more support even to almost equal to the uh, Ukraine, like the support that is they are providing right now, not the one that was a month ago. Huh? So it's it's going to almost that level of support, because you know uh, in Azerbaijan suddenly you can have that uh, not only you can have a military conflict not only with one country but the several countries at the same time. Uh, this and Azerbaijan is a territory wise is a uh, no, like even comparing to Ukraine. Uh, is much smaller. Uh, and if Ukraine can uh, let Russian troops to come to the depths of the country for 90, 60, 200 kilometers and then start attacking logistical lines of the Russian troops and then win that, Azerbaijan and the Georgia also being uh, smaller in, in terms of the size, uh, in terms of the, the territory, um, that is going to make a huge cost. So is Azerbaijan ready to to be this gas, oil, energy, transport route, and uh, other communication uh, lines. Yeah, sure, it's great opportunity. Like, if this works out, uh, I believe that Georgian and Azerbaijan economy, and if Armenia wants Armenian economy, they are going to benefit a lot. But again, the question is that, uh, can Azerbaijan tolerate political, military cost of this decision? Um, it's it's beyond uh, anyone in the region. So that's why it's the question to the the European Union and the United States. To I what see. extent? Sorry. I see. I understand. So to what extent they are ready to um, uh, this idea to work out? And actually, like the Azerbaijan and Georgia, they are becoming the only access point for the uh, European Union and the United States to the Central Asia. Mm -hmm. Also, so there is uh, so many other issues going on. So, so that's why, you know, like when you um, the previous questions that, uh, the, the, you know, uh, about the, the regional uh, uh, the future of the region, there's too many determinants. It's not the possible right now. So that, and that this is additional and the determinant, I would say, in this regard. Regarding uh, what, a, what Azerbaijan and Armenian experts can do, what uh, sorry, what Azerbaijan and Armenian can do together. Well, uh, last month on the 6th of April, uh, like the Azerbaijan and Armenian uh, experts, uh, they meet in Brussels. Uh, it was organized by Links Europe. The uh, organization that coordinated all efforts uh, in Azerbaijan was Caucasus Post Analysis Center, which is like the, our center. And from Armenia, it was uh, Benjamin Pagasian Center. That was the guest to your uh, show last time. And we had uh, quite uh, uh, important discussions uh, in, in that event. Uh, but the, the one of the most important achievement of it was that uh, Armenian and Azerbaijan experts can, can talk to each other. I remember my last meetings with uh, Armenian uh, experts, Armenian counterparts before the pandemic. So before there was a pandemic, then there was a war. So for a long time, and the Armenians and the Azerbaijans, they could not meet. So the, the very last meetings they, that I participated was in the November and December of 2019. And in that meetings, Armenian and Azerbaijan experts, civil society members, they have nothing to discuss about. 
I'm not talking about agreeing on anything. They have nothing to talk about. It was repeated. So there was a crisis even within uh, the community of the think tankers, researchers, and society. Mm -hmm. So, and I was warning all the organizers that this is going to transform into something big. If there is a um, Armenian and Azerbaijan expert cannot talk to each other, so it means that imagine what's the situation uh, between the government officials and between others. So uh, that's going to transform into something uh, devastating, and that transformed into war. Uh, so that's why now that Armenians and Azerbaijans they can meet in Brussels and accept the uh, set of uh, let's say proposals, and it's Whoa. basically a roadmap. And Armenian and Azerbaijan experts they mutually agreed on them. That's a great achievement. So that's why where they can start talking. So probably it's about now it's time for expert community to talk that, to explore all the possibilities. And we have put our suggestions in that document. If you want, you can Google. Uh, it's called uh, 30 Steps Before 2030. Uh, so this is the document available uh, online. So uh, you can see the suggestions there. So I don't want to take much time, frankly speaking. Yeah. Thank you. And I, yeah, and I, we are out of the time, frankly speaking. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmad. Juan, your last comments, and we have to, unfortunately, the time is really <laughs> running out too fast. And uh, uh, then, um, then, then I will be very short. I, would, I don't want to exhaust our listeners. Uh, hopefully, uh, the peace will come to the, our region. And finally, uh, you know, the, these three countries, we have chosen three different political tracks, I mean the Georgia, uh, Euro-Atlantic, uh, uh, Armenia uh, is become Russian-led uh, CSTO, uh, Azerbaijan is a member of the non-alignment movement, but uh, hopefully we will uh, be able in near future to talk about our common future together, common future of our uh, region. So it will make three people, three nation of the South Caucasus more stronger uh, and we might provide more the life that we deserve with dignity, with, you know, uh, with secure environment and, and et cetera. Can't That's agree all. more with these uh, optimistic uh, messages and notes. Uh, let me uh, conclude our very, very interesting uh, discussion today and wish you success uh, uh, to, and uh, express my gratitude for your time and for your participation and express my hope that in future we will also have to uh, have the chance to continue our discussions and to uh, explore more uh, opposi uh, opportunities and possibilities for uh, the normalization of the uh, relationship between Azerbaijan and Armenia. We should success. And uh, again, thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, well, thank you very much. And uh, Thank you. It was a great pleasure. My pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you.